Thank you. Hi. So this talk is uh, one of the series of Django talks focusing on workflows. Uh, first, just an intro about our company. It's, it's Advisor Stream. Uh, we license third-party content, mostly from you know, very recognized publishers, like say the Globe and Mail, New York Times. We put that together in a library and make that available to investment advisors to, be, to use in their client communications, such as newsletters, emails, social media posts, and so forth. We are currently in the process of basically rebuilding our, our technology, and we've chosen Django, and we're following uh, some API-first design principles and using AngularJS. So where do workflows come into this? It's, it's something that you, you have if you, if your application has use cases that have collaborating actors, in our case, that would be the investment advisor choosing content and, say, constructing a newsletter. You might have, there's, a, say, a compliance officer who needs to make approvals so that the content can be sent out. You can have curators also who choose content to be packaged and distributed to other advisors. And then even your, your salary background jobs, the things that distribute, do the, the back end work, those are kind of also actors in the system. And the key thing to recognize is you need to maintain some sort of a state in, in the processing of this, these activities. And you'll, you might also know that you know, as the as app grows, you, you get you know, more workflows that are basically similar. They may be built out of very, very same, you know, similar interactions but just have small variations between them. So when we were looking at how we were going to address this issue, one thing that became apparent is that you know, Django, no, rest frame, no web framework really directly addresses these sorts of problems. They provide you with all the tooling that you need to handle everything from the database you know, through um, you know, handling the whole request response lifecycle and, and rendering a template or outputting whatever information or in whatever format you're using. They're really great for that. But then sort of there's the, well, between requests, any, you know, <coughs> that logic that applies, that ties it all together, there's really nothing. You're just kind of on your own and you just have to figure it out. So let's just consider sort of a, a naive approach. If, if you were to just say, okay, I want to get this. Oh, okay, we're back in business. So quickly, so, and when, you, when you're faced with a sort of a, a workflow situation, sort of a, maybe a basic sort of first cut naive approach would be, well, I'll just start to sprinkle in some state variables in, into my models, you know, along with the, the, their information content. So, you know, some Booleans or some, some choice-based char, char fields. Um, I'll write some decision logic then maybe in, in my views or, or in my models, depending on where I prefer. Um, I might do something um, in my API, I might reveal some of these variables and you know, state variables such that then my, my API, my front end code would then consume these and then also be able to make decisions. Um, there's some problems with this obviously. I mean, you'll get up and running pretty quickly, but you know, as you maintain your project, your UI code is now sort of tied in with your, your workflow design. Um, your business logic is sort of scattered everywhere. So if, you know, you're looking at any piece of code at any point, you just sort of see what's going on there. You can't sort of see the forest for the trees. And as things grow, you know, you're, you add and add and, you know, oh, add another state. Oh, here, here's, you know, another nested level of, you know, conditionals. And pretty soon, you know, here you are. And if else, if hell. So, so to combat this, uh, you know, what are some design goals that we want? I mean, we want to separate out the, you know, the business logic from, from, view, from view logic. View logic should really just be about you know, getting information in and out of the system. Um, you don't want your, your nice data models to be polluted with all these state variables. You want to facilitate code reuse. 
And uh, then there's also the matter of sort of managing access to, to the different types of workflows, because you might have different users who are actually using slightly different workflows um, for whatever purpose. So as we're figuring out this problem, we looked at what's available in the Django ecosystem. And we came across Viewflow. It kind of seemed to be the only package in, in the category that's really actively maintained. Um, it's, uh, in, its architecture allows you to basically define any kind of workflow by just subclassing this, this flow class and then writing in a series of nodes that are then interconnected. It's, it's a kind of a, it's a very nice uh, declarative style of, of language. I mean, it's Python based. Um, I'll get to an example in a minute. When a, when a flow is activated, there's a, there's a process created and a series of, of, of tasks are associated with that process. Each one of those is then governed by a finite state machine, which uh, it really helps to, to, I guess, make the, the design you know, sane. Um, there's an admin uh, facility for, for managing the, the processes and tasks. And, um, let's see. Oh, yes, and it ties in with a Django permission system. So you can just declare what permission is needed to initiate a process or access a particular uh, part of that. So let's take, in, take a look at an example. Oh, that's huge. OK. So this is just a, a sort of simplified, it's, it's not, this doesn't involve multiple different users, but it, it, it's enough to kind of give you a sense of sort of how a workflow is constructed. Um, the main thing about this, this design, what, what I think is really great, is everything is <clears throat> all here within a single class. I don't have to look, go looking through different source files to figure out what, you know, what does this flow do. Uh, in this case, this one sort of, this handles uh, sending of a, a basic uh, newsletter. It doesn't have any compliance functionality. So there's, uh, there's a start, which is tied to a view. So this is for an end user to initiate the, uh, this process. Um, this is a, then another view class. This allows uh, an update. Each one of these, you know, okay, so this one has a permission, so um, lets me s control like, who can access it. Each one has a next uh, element, which basically says, what is the flow? When it's completed, where does it go next? So after you start, you are now able to update. After we receive an update, what do we do? Oh, here's a conditional. Uh, it checks a condition. And then, depending on the result, goes to some other part of the flow. Um, I'll skip over that one. Here's an example of a split. What this allows you to do is the, it effectively forks the process into multiple streams, and you can have parallel executing tasks, which is handy. And in this case, we can, we can allow the user, they have the option, they can send a test. Um, they can actually, they can send off the, the newsletter right now. Or they can, they can make further updates. Uh, this send here, this is a background salary job. And on and on, uh, some of this stuff is code in progress. Finally, it it joins down here in the bottom and reaches the end state, which basically puts the, the process in the finished state, marks this done, sets the finished uh, timestamp, and, and there you go. So that, that's a very basic kind of workflow that you can build. Um, obviously, um, most of these are sort of pre-made sort of nodes that are defined in the package, but you can also create your own. So I mentioned that our application is also, it's, a, it's an API-first design. So it's, all, it's based on Django REST framework. And when we first started using, when we looked at Django views, we thought, 
great, this is awesome. It, it, it maps exactly to our requirements, except, well, it, it really only works with Django forms and views sort of in a, in a classic application design. So, oh, that, that's, that's not great. Um, what can we do? Um, so, kind of looking in the code a little bit, hacking around, eventually we realize, okay, with about 100 lines of code, we could integrate it with REST framework. So what does this look like? Uh, oops. So here's an example of, of a process exposed through the REST framework. It's, we basically just made it a, a type of resource. And you'll notice that we have these active tasks attributes added to it. So the interactions are presented here. Well, the, the currently available interactions are presented here. And what that means is that our UI code can basically look for this attribute and and, uh, and keying off that knows what to do. So it, it effectively allows us to, to decouple uh, the, U, the UI design uh, from the logic in the back end. So really, it's all maintained in one place. Things can change in the back end, and we don't always have to update our, our API. So I think I am being told. OK. Um, well, thank you very much.